Good morning. Please stand in body or in spirit to join in our responsive call to worship. Let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made both the Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom we crucify. Brothers and sisters, what shall we do? Let us repent in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Christ, our sins are forgiven. In the name of Christ, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for us and for our children. It is for all who are far away. The promise is for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Our first hymn today is 495. God's amazing love is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. God of compassion and holiness, you have revealed your risen Son to us through the Scriptures but we refuse to recognize him. We ask that you will open our eyes and deal with our sin. Forgive us and redirect us, O Lord. Cleanse us from all our iniquities and purify our lives. By the blood of Christ, heal us, and by the Holy Spirit, transform us. Free us to engage in holy endeavors that we may glorify you and serve those around us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. 
May the God of mercy who forgives us all our sins strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep us in eternal life. Amen. We'd like to invite the children now for the children's sermon. things that are perishable and things that are imperishable, all right? Perishable things are things that don't last. They're things that are here for just a little while and they go away. Imperishable things are things that last a long time. And I was trying to figure out, you know, think about our house and what we have in there, what is probably the most imperishable thing we have in the house. And I came up with this, which is our frying pan, okay? There are people, okay? that have frying pans made out of cast iron that go back to the 1800s that they are still using, all right? These things will last your whole lifetime. They'll last past your lifetime. This is something that's very close to being imperishable, all right? It's going to last, okay? Now, I say very close. I say very close because is this going to last forever? No. No, it won't last forever. And in fact... In fact, if I were to take this and I were to heat it up and I were to fill the sink with water that wasn't warm enough and I were to take it as it was very, very hot and dip it in the water, do you know what would happen? A fire. Oh, <laughs> no, not a fire. It would crack. It would break into pieces, right? Because this lasts a long time. I can run it over with my car. If our house caught fire, it would survive. But it can't survive everything. It's not going to last for absolutely ever. There's going to time come a time when even this tough cast iron pan is going to maybe it's die. Okay, all right. Oh, but do you know what does last forever? Uh, God. Yes. <laughs> right. You're correct. God does is imperishable. Right. He's never going to perish. Right. And because he has love for us and because we have love for God, that means that we are not going to perish either. We're going to have what's called eternal life. And because, that's, he, because even though you think that's not true, you, you might have to think that then. Because you're not going to die. You're not going to die. You're not going to be dead when you die. You're, no one's actually going to die. All it is is they're moving on. places. Okay. It's kind of like moving from your house to a different place. Sounds good. <laughs> yes, and so we have a belief. We believe that death is not the end for us, that God is imperishable, and because God is imperishable, that makes us imperishable as well. So let's pray and thank God for that, all right? I'll say some words, and you all repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God, Dear God we thank you. We thank you. That you go on forever. That you go on forever. And that we will too. And that we will too. And we pray this. And we pray this. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, thank you for coming down. Now you can head down to children's yeah. worship with Miss Julie or back with your parents. Oh, yeah. Daddy, Daddy come with like me. You, like you do. Dad, every time.
As God has been glorified in that wonderful anthem, may he so be glorified in the reading of his word. Let us pray. Draw us close, Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of your truth and grace. Amen. Our gospel reading today is from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Listen for the word of God. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all of these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place? There in these days, he asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find the body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. 
Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Our epistolary reading for today comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13-23. through 23. Listen for the word of God. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct, for it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. So ends today's scripture readings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. David, thank you very much. The readings are complex today, especially that of First Peter uh, that I want to speak on today, uh, because they, uh, for, uh, it is difficult sometimes to understand the context in which Peter uh, is. Uh, this letter is being written in First Peter. It, that uh, it's a late writing in uh, in our Christian history with regard to the books in our New Testament. Uh, it's late in the sense that. Uh, uh, Christianity is now um, fairly well established by uh, uh, many decades leading into the next century. And uh, Christians now are being uh, experiencing suffering through various forms of persecution. Uh, so much so that uh, you see Peter referring to the Christians as though they are living in exile, referring to the fact that our true home is heaven. And <coughs> in this world that we live in now, is the exile that we are in until the time when we can return home. That, uh, in effect, it's, uh, it's one that is, uh, presents uh, a more interesting challenge when he offers up uh, his version of uh, something that we find all throughout the New Testament. What does he say? He says here, um, he offers this injunction to the, the Christians who are reading this letter. He says, be holy. Be holy. 
as God is holy. I imagine that a lot of us probably find that objectionable. God is holy. How are we supposed to be holy like God? But that's the, that's the injunction that 1 Peter puts before Christians. Uh, Matthew, in his gospel, in the Sermon on the Mount, has a, a similar uh, type of statement, uh, something that we'd probably put in the same camp, where uh, in that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, <coughs> Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. It's saying much the same thing. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. What kind of judgment is God placing on us through Jesus Christ to expect us to be perfect like God in heaven is perfect? Or when 1 Peter challenges Christians to be holy in their lives like God is holy. How can we possibly do that? Is God really going to hold us to that standard? God the judge looking down upon us, commanding us to be perfect when we know we are not. And not only calling us to be perfect, but to be perfect like God is perfect. How can we, <coughs> how can we rise to such a challenge? We live in a world, my Christian friends, where uh, people are, are working and uh, struggling to meet the claims that are placed on their lives? When do we have time, in addition to all the things we're having to do in life, to be holy? When do we have time to set aside some time in the day to be perfect, even for a moment? How do we manage the fact that we live in a world where so many people have, have uh, struggled to just uh, keep food on the table? trying to keep their jobs in the midst of an, uh, an unpredictable economy and still trying to recover from a pandemic. How can we manage all of this and be perfect? How can we manage all of this and be holy when we're just trying to live through the mundaneness of life? Life's just too tough, we might think, for us to, uh, to be holy, and, and it's even too tough for God himself to be requiring us to be holy, to be perfect. How do we meet that obligation? It is certainly clear that, that God is portrayed here as a judge, an impartial judge, but a judge nonetheless. Of course, we, we would like to think of judges as being impartial. He reminds us that when we look at God as our judge, how does he phrase it? He says here that we need to approach God in fear. In fear. Why? Because probably Peter and Jesus and the other participants in our New Testament lection know perfectly well that we deserve the judgment of God. We are sinners. True, my Christian friends, God is judge, God's impartial. God, as a judge, does not like sin. But in truth, let's admit it, we shouldn't like sin either, should we? We should not. Now, we're told to fear God, but the early readers would have understood this in the same way that one is to have reverence before someone who is superior to us. And when it, we, we use the word fear in a way different than it was used in the ancient world. Fear was simply another way of having reverence or respect for those who were in authority. We use fear to talk about a state of being that we just can't seem to escape. We live in fear over things we can't even control. We, as human beings, seem to be a, a, an exception to the rest of creation. I attribute it to sin. We are an exception to the rest of creation because the, whenever uh, other, other life in creation is afraid, they simply run out of danger and they, are, they stop being afraid. Not us. We find lots of reasons to be afraid in the course of our lives. We, we are afraid of, of, uh, of losing our jobs. We're, we're worried about uh, uh, 
whether or not our families are going to be okay and healthy. We, we worry about our own death, our own mortality. Things we can't control. We intentionally put ourselves in fear instead of just trusting life to be what it is, to trust God to be God. Peter is calling them to have reverence for the judge, not, not terror before the judge. And we have a reason not to live in terror. You might think, well, of course we've got to be in terror. God just commanded us to live perfectly. I can't be perfect. I've already, I've, that, that ship's already sailed. I can't go back and change the fact that I've already messed up. And even if I dared hope to be perfect in the future, what I discover in the next hour or two, I've screwed up again. Where is that holiness that I'm supposed to be? Where is that perfection that Jesus calls me to in the Sermon on the Mount? It comes in recognizing what he says, what Peter says about the Christians. They are children of God. That we are not looking at God as just God. We are looking at God in the phrase he uses, Father. Familiar. One who loves and one who calls us to love, which is exactly what the passage says. Just as there is an injunction to be perfect, to be holy, there is the injunction to love one another. To love one another. And there are many variations within the New Testament of Peter's statement here about loving one another. We see it in, in Romans, we see it in Thessalonians, we see it in the Johannine literature, we see it in Hebrews, calling us to love one another. That's the hallmark of, of discipleship. That's the, that's the mark of being a Christian, our willingness against everything else to love even the unlovable. That's what we are called to do. I submit to you, my Christian friends, that's what holiness is. That's what the perfection is to which we have been summoned. To love one another. To love one another. Let me add this one statement to you uh, about the nature of perfection. To show, by the way, how we misread it in Scripture. We think of perfection as not ever making a mistake. Never stumbling, never having sinned, that's usually how we think of perfection. But the word in Greek means to, to be perfect means to be complete, to be whole, to be exactly what a thing is meant to be. That's its perfection. When Jesus commands us to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect, he is simply saying, be what you were created to be, holy, just as God is exactly who he is in himself. The challenge is not for us to be God. The challenge is to be the best human being God made you to be. That is the perfection to which you are called. And how are we created? To love one another. To love one another. Maybe you think it's just impossible to love one another. Maybe you think it's impossible to love certain people. <laughs> I will tell you, my Christian friends, the call to love one another is a sign of what it means to be a disciple. Jesus says so. And I am pretty certain Jesus doesn't give us a commandment that we can't keep. How cruel a judge that would be to command us to do something that we can't do and then judge us on top of not keeping a commandment we can't keep. God does not do that. Jesus Christ calls us to love one another. We can do it. It's constant work. It's constant discipline. But that's why we're called disciples. We can love one another. And we can even love those persons in the world who will not love us back. We can do it. I know. I do it. 
And I don't think I'm any more special than anyone else. I know you can do it. I've seen you do it. I've seen you love people who will not love you back. Lots of people in the world don't want to love us back that we still have to love. There are a lot of people in this church that don't love me, but I love them back. You know, that's what we do. That's what we do. Because we are called by God to be perfect. That's what perfect is. We are called to be holy. That's what holy is. The demand for holiness is not something that you can't live up to. Don't worry if, whether or not you think of yourself as saintly like Mother Teresa or any other saint or, or spiritual person that you think you can name in your heart and soul. Just be the loving you that you are. That's all you have to do. And don't give up on it. Even against all the odds that tell you you are unlovable. Even those who come at you and tell you that you're not worth loving. You love them nonetheless. Do you want to see God? Do you want to see the holiness of God? Do you want to see the perfection of God, my Christian friends? Love one another. The story that was told of, of the disciples on the road to Emmaus in, in Luke's gospel that David read for us. Note they have a stranger walking with them. It happens to be Jesus, but they don't know it. But nonetheless, in compassion, in mercy, they reach out to this stranger once they arrive at Emmaus. They invite him to their table. A stranger, a complete stranger. They don't know this guy from Adam. Actually, that works. That, that statement actually works in this case, doesn't it? <laughs> um, they didn't know this guy from Adam. But as soon as they break bread with him, they see the face of God. They recognize their risen Lord. I submit to you, my Christian friends, in love for others, sit down with a stranger, break bread with them. Maybe you'll see the holiness of God. Maybe you'll see the perfection of God in the person on the other side of the table. Love one another. Be holy as God is holy. Amen, and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name. having heard how God has called us to faith in the proclamation of the word, we now offer an opportunity in our worship for us to reaffirm our faith in God, in Jesus Christ. Today, I uh, invite you to share together in the uh, reaffirmation of faith. This one, 
uh, for today comes from part of our, our Presbyterian tradition, our Reformed tradition. This is, the Heidelberg, this is an excerpt from the Heidelberg Catechism. I invite you to join with me as we reaffirm our faith. We believe in God, the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth with all that is in them, who also upholds and governs them by his eternal counsel and providence. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's own eternal Son, who is ordained by the Father and anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our only High Priest, having redeemed us by the sacrifice of his body and ever in seeking for us before the Father and to be our eternal King, governing us by word and spirit in the redemption he has won for us. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who with the Father and the Son is equally eternal God, that the Spirit is given to us through true faith to share in Christ and all his benefits, and that the Spirit comforts us and abideth with us forever. We believe that we belong to body and soul, in life and in death, not to ourselves, but to our Savior, Jesus Christ. I see we have a moment for mission schedule today. I believe uh, one of our elders from the administration committee, uh, Bill Mitchell, uh, is bringing us this message today about our needs assessment coming up on May 21st. Uh, Bill wanted me to pass him, uh, so I'm giving you a heads up, Eric. I'm passing the gooseneck mic down to, uh, to Bill. Uh, make sure I've got enough cord here for you, sir. Um, there you go. Good morning. Good morning. Still advice to say good morning. I guess it is still morning. Uh, I'm here to bring some detailed information from the section of the congregation about our all uh, congregational gathering that's scheduled for Sunday, May the 21st. The background, some background for this is that uh, in the session meeting February 28th, the Christian Education Committee made a recommendation for an all-church needs assessment gathering. The motion was approved. On the recommendation of Reverend Lisa I, who is with the Presbytery Transitional Program, Reverend Dr. Peggy Hines was contacted. Reverend Hines holds a Master of Divinity degree and Doctor of Ministry degrees from Columbia Theological Seminary. Peggy has provided pastoral, consultative, and assessment of services for a number of regional churches. During the March 28th meeting of the session, the session was introduced to Dr. Himes and planning was begun to hold an all-congregational gathering following the worship service on Sunday, May 21st, four weeks from today. The purpose of the gathering is to share thoughts, to be embodied in a needs assessment analysis, to aid us moving forward cohesively in a post-COVID era with robust resources but a smaller congregation. A congregational luncheon will be provided by the Christian Education Committee. Your attendance and your participation and input in this are essential. 
After lunch, Reverend Hines will moderate conversational discussions in which all church members will have an opportunity to share individually and small group and whole group input regarding what we believe our outreach to the community should encompass. We plan to provide ample time using those small group activities and written assessment tools for each person attending to have an opportunity to voice hopes and dreams for the direction of the congregation's efforts. Reverend Hines will collect and collate our congregation's information and provide a report to the session and subsequently to the congregation providing both qualitative information and quantitative data. The goal of the session is to have all voices heard, enhance congregational unification, and provide directions for growth of the church cohesively in doing Christ's work in the world. I can share with you that the minute permission is much easier than doing a word with the younger church. Thank you. <laughs> Bill, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I, since I've already pulled some of the uh, the line out, I'm going to let. Uh, I hope this you won't mind, but I'm just let that dangle because it would just take me too long right now, and. Uh, uh, I'm sure you want to uh, get to uh, the restaurants before the Baptists. Uh, so, uh, that said, uh, uh, Bill, thank you very much, by the way. That's a wonderful announcement for us, and I hope everyone will avail themselves on May 21st, that Sunday, for both lunch and for the opportunity for us to, uh, to do a, a, a congregational uh, assessment of our needs uh, as we look forward to moving forward in the future uh, as, uh, as First Presbyterian Church here in Richmond and uh, whatever other outreach we can do in the world. Uh, so, uh, Bill, again, thank you so much. At this point in our service of worship, uh, let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, again, we struggle and strive in life. Perhaps some of our struggles measure up to the same kinds of sufferings that were faced by the Christians of the first and second century. Maybe so, maybe less. Maybe they're different in form. But they are so trying in our lives that it's so difficult sometimes to be mindful of your holiness, to be mindful of your perfection. It is sometimes difficult to remember the call by your Son, our Lord and Savior, to love one another. Still, we pray that by your Spirit you will discipline us so that we might truly be family, truly children of God, tru truly ones who love as you love. Help us to reach out in concern for others, that even in the face of the stranger, we might see your divine presence. Help us to act in all loving ways by feeding the hungry, clothing those in need, speaking up for the marginalized, welcoming the stranger. We pray for all of this as a sign of our efforts to be full in and of ourselves, to be holy as you are holy. We pray in Christ's most holy name, he who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now it's at this point in our service of worship, as we continue to worship God, who gave of himself for us, for us to recognize true worship requires us to give of ourselves for God and for one another, uh, as we are... Uh, afforded the opportunity to meditate during the time of the offertory, let us meditate on the giving of ourselves in all forms uh, as, we, as we consider our worship of God and his giving himself to us.
though daunting, is possible by the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who set the example for us of loving one another. May we, too, with our gifts, our time, our talents, our very lives, offer these as signs of love for the world that you so much love you gave your Son. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. the benediction, I do want to uh, uh, let you know that uh, uh, it is uh, our church's turn to host the service of worship over at McCready Manor. Uh, so if you have, uh, if you still have your bulletin in good shape but don't want to take it home, just leave it and we'll, we'll pick it up and let it be used again uh, over there in that service. Uh, we're going to do something new. I, I didn't have a chance to tell Wendy who usually goes there, but uh, uh, when we use this bulletin, the, the, uh, the people there notice that we have a children's message. And, of course, I never deliver that because I'm not the one who usually gives it. But, uh, but Joel has very graciously agreed to go over there at 2 o'clock with us, and he's going to uh, um, do the children's message for them that he just did for us. Uh, so you've got your skillet ready, right? <laughs> okay, all right, very good. Um, with that said, my Christian friends, I charge you to go in peace. Live as free people, serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always. Mm -hmm.